members of the Finance and Investment Committee meeting of Valley Hills Water District on Monday, April 29th at 3.30 p.m. So we call the order and we'll turn it over to the GM to introduce us to the uh, item number one here. All and right, so this is, this is just an update and you're going to hear from uh, Chandler Asset Management. They've been with us, how long has it been now? A little over a, a year. A little over a year now. So about a year. So time flies, doesn't it? Yes, it does. We're going to give you an update on how things are going and maybe some thoughts for moving forward. So I'm not sure, Mia, if I turn over to you or... I'll go ahead and introduce Jenny since this is her first time with us today. I'm, I'm Mia Corral brown and it's a pleasure to be back here uh, at Bellicitos Water District. So this afternoon I have Jenny Linguix and Jenny co-manages the district's portfolio alongside uh, Jason Schmidt, who you've met a couple of times in the past. And so she's going to share with you um, the economic backdrop for which you're investing in. I know you had uh, some potential questions about LAFE versus that of the investment portfolio, and then she is going to present uh, proposed changes to the district's investment policy. We have a memo along with uh, those proposed changes, and I'll go ahead and turn the uh, presentation over to Jenny. So All right. Jenny, go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Mia. Thanks for having us here today. For just one yeah, second, of course. Jenny, I'm sorry. Yes. So we have a full packet that's sitting in the middle of the table for everyone here, actually. It starts with what they'll be talking about today. So that's the at least part of it. Um, mm -hmm. You didn't want us to read this ahead of time? Yeah. Oh, no, I actually emailed it. I emailed it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> a half hour ago? So, unfortunately, right. you got it last night, I think, and I didn't have Director Snell's email address. I, I had. It's, good. it's top secret. It's top secret. I got if you have it, you just got to kill you. I got his this morning, so I emailed him this afternoon. Um, I yeah, this was all in there. So, you have a copy of the investment policy that's red lined, so that's showing the changes that Chandler's recommending. And then you have the draft budget, which we'll talk about afterwards, and the, the support for that. So they're going to be talking about the policy as well as their strategy. And for okay. purposes of convenience, along with the presentation, there is a copy of the memo that we sent over to Wes and Anthony, along with the red, uh, red line version of the IP. So you don't have to dig through, it's handy right here. Uh, <laughs> theirs is much prettier than mine, too. So. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I wanted to start off, as Mia mentioned, with a brief overview of what's going on in the economy. So please feel free to, to ask questions as we go along. And if you want me to truncate a little bit if I'm going on too long, I know we're a little bit limited on time. We have a lot to get through. So, um, so feel free to, you to can jump truncate in. away. Yeah, okay. All right. So I'm going to start off on slide number three. And I just want to talk about some major themes that we're seeing in the market right now that have an impact on the district's portfolio. And the first one has been the interest rate environment that we're in. We've been in a rising rate environment up until now. Um, the Federal Reserve has hiked interest rates nine times since 2015, so quarter point hikes, so real steady. Um, and that's been happening pretty steadily, but now they've, they've finally kind of um, held off on that. Um, the economy's been doing really well, but um, that brings us to the second theme. We're starting to see some uh, some signs of global slowdown in places like China and Europe, some of these major economies, and there's a little bit of concern that that could start to impact the U.S. market. Um, so far, the U.S. market's been really strong, but, um, but it's something that the Fed wants to be aware of, and they've also raised rates so quickly, they, the last thing that they want to do is send us right back into a recession. And in the past, the Fed has made mistakes like that, where they've hiked too quickly, and it's ended up slowing down the economy too much, and these, these rate hikes tend to have a lag effect. So, you know, we're already starting to see in the housing market and things like that, you know, with higher rates, that's starting to have an impact. So, um, so they just kind of want to wait and see what's going to happen, and they don't want to upset the apple cart at this point. Um, so, on the second theme is just some of the, the headwinds that the um, that we're facing in the U.S. Um, you know, some of the some of the trade issues um, between countries that we think that that's transitory and it's going to get resolved, um, but it's it's had a little bit of an impact on the economy. Um, we're expecting GDP to be a little bit slower this year. Last year it was very strong. In 2018, the average was about 2.9% overall. And we're expecting about just a little bit slower, still, still good, but 2 to 2.5% for, for 2019. And the third theme is the shape of the yield curve right now. Um, with the Fed rate hikes, we're sitting at about 2.5%, um, 2, 2 and a quarter to 2.5%. But we've really seen longer um, term yields have come down significantly since December. So the district had a strategy of investing about $3 million a month just to kind of layer that in and dollar cost average over time. And I think that was a really smart strategy because we really saw a lot of volatility in rates throughout 2018. And it was really difficult to try to call or predict what was gonna happen with that. So um, we saw pretty much the high in rates, we saw them spike in May and then again in December. And since then they've come down quite a bit. So 
we saw them over 3%, and now we're back to sitting around 2.3% currently. So it's really been a dramatic move that we've seen. Um, however, you know, given all these factors, we're not expecting a recession in the next six months or so. And the reason for that uh, mainly is because of the strong employment environment. On the next slide, we have um, some employment information. For example, um, non-farm payrolls shows the number of jobs that are added to the economy in the U.S. every month. And you can see it's a very volatile number, so we don't look at any one, you know, you can see that that, um, you know, the December, January information was impacted by the government shutdown a little bit. But you can see that it rebounded in March, 196,000 jobs were added. Um, I prefer to look at the rolling six month average because that's, it takes some of the volatility out of it. And so we're averaging over 200,000 jobs a month being added to the US economy. So that's more than enough that we need for population growth and nutrition. Um, so as a result, the unemployment rate, which you probably hear about in the news um, on the graph on the right, has been quite low. So the gray line is the headline number, and that was sitting at 3.8% for March. And then the green line on the top is 7.3%. That's underemployment, which is part-time workers and people that are underemployed in general. Um, so we're basically sitting at, at full employment right now. The participation rate is about 63%, um, which is just slightly below average, but still pretty good. And then we've got wage growth is, has finally jumped up. It's gone to about 3.2%. So that's sitting a little bit ahead of inflation, which is on the next page. Um, so we've got... Uh, Can I have a quick question? Yeah, yeah sure. Huh? Comments. Yeah. We attended last month the uh, North County Economic Development Corporation, and they had their economist in from Wells Fargo Bank uh -huh. from D.C. And it's amazing that your conclusions and his conclusions are basically the same, uh -huh. which is very good. But I, I, I think that interests me, like, uh, the three month TV is generally viewed as a powerful predictive sign of an upcoming recession. Mm -hmm. Well, there's always an upcoming recession. It's Sometimes, a question right. of imminent <laughs> or not imminent. Yes, right. And it doesn't say that. And I'm just curious as to what your thoughts on yeah. the recession are. That's a great question. His word is one coming, of course, there always yeah. is. That's when. When. You that's, never know until after, right? You never know exactly when you're in a recession. Right. Um, our expectation is that we don't expect one in the next six to 12 months. We think the earliest you would start to see it might be 2020. So we think that we still have some time uh, before we have to worry about that. And the U.S. economy has quite a bit of momentum right now, and it's really, really strong. So we think it's going to take some time before that starts to get pulled down. And you think it's going to be as bad as the last recession no. or not? No. no. We okay. think it's going to be more a more shallow type of recession. We still think that, uh, you know, we, we've been kind of sitting, growth hasn't been, a lot of times before a recession you'll see growth really spike. We haven't seen that. It's been very steady, very sustainable, <coughs> and it's been a nice long recovery. It's been one of the most long, the longest recoveries in history. Yeah. And so I think that this is the kind of growth you want to have for an economy. You want it to be sustainable and not, not you know, it's, it's not indicative of things getting too hot at this point. Slow, Thank steady you. growth without the bubbles right. mm -hmm. in the market that we saw right. the last time. Right. right. We're, we're not seeing those extremes. And we're, the other thing that we look at is personal balance sheets and savings rates of, of consumers. And the savings rate has been very strong. It's been around 6%. And although we are seeing consumer credit start to spike up, which is a little bit of a cause for concern, uh, we also feel that people aren't as overextended as they were the last time. You don't see people buying three houses, you know, when, when they barely afford one so so that's that's been positive I have a quick question yeah so as you see stuff starting to slow down a bit what's kind of your your take on the duration of portfolio yeah that's a great question yeah so we've been pretty close to neutral maybe a little bit on the short side and I think we're gonna we're gonna be moving closer to neutral I think over time and we've been doing that um, because we we feel that it's possible that the Fed might hike rates again in 2020, but they, they've been pretty clear that they're not going to hike again this year. They, I mean, they're going to wait and see unless something drastic changes about the situation. So we're moving things closer to neutral now. What, what does that mean, moving to a neutral? Yeah, so we'll talk about the portfolio, um, the duration of the portfolio right now. You know, it's a little bit short of the benchmark. The benchmark's around 1.85, and that's in terms of like weighted average life is around 1.8. So that's like the average maturity of the portfolio. Explain life, 1.8 what? Years. Like years, years. as in years, yes. for example. And duration is a little bit different, but it's, it's similar for, for that, those purposes. But it's, an, it's a measure of interest rate risk in your portfolio, basically. So the more duration you have, or the, more, the longer the years, the more interest rate risk you have. Um, so your portfolio is sitting just short of that. So we're, we've been very defensive in the rising rate environment. But now that we feel that rates are probably not going to go much higher from here, we're moving closer to neutral. But we haven't really deviated. We don't, we don't deviate very much from the benchmark at a given time. And so I think strategy-wise, um, you know, 
it sounds like it's a different district's preference to not make sales with security. So this is really, the strategy that you have is really an ideal strategy. You know, if you don't want to sell anything, this is about as long as you want to be. So I think you're in a good spot right now. Okay, so looking at, um, at costs, inflation, that environment on slide number five. This is the, the second half of the Fed's dual mandate. The first one is employment, more full employment. So the other thing that they're looking at very closely is prices and inflation. So the CPI is something that you probably hear about in the news quite a bit. And that's been sitting right around 2%. The green line on the chart on the left is the headline number. That's at 1.9% for March. And then the more stable core number that excludes food and energy is sitting right at 2%. Uh, the Fed prefers to look at the personal consumption expenditure data because they feel that that's more accurate. And core PCE information just came out this morning, so it's not on this chart, but um, we were sitting at about 1.6% for March. So we're looking at 1.5% to 2% for prices, but this is lower than what the Fed was expecting. It's really subdued right now, um, you know, partly due to the strength of the dollar. Um, but overall, I, you know, I think that... Um, the Fed was expecting to see much higher inflation. We might start to get that because I mean, you may have noticed that gasoline and oil prices have spiked up a little bit. So that will contribute to higher inflation. Um, you know, in general, tariffs tend to be inflationary. We haven't seen too much of that yet. But you know, on the margin, it could cause push some prices up over time. But it really, I mean, the the the, 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 the deflationary forces of globalization have been much stronger than anything. Quick question. Uh, yeah. CPI. Yeah. National CPI, San Diego CPI. This is the yeah. This is the national. Okay. Yeah, San Diego CPI is a little bit higher. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have that I data know on. Paying more, that's why I don't know yeah, what yeah. Ex well, exactly. Yeah, it's it's definitely going up more than two percent here in San Diego. I, I definitely feel that that's mm -hmm. the case with food and things like that. Yes. But when you go to Middle America, the prices haven't been as as high. And we're starting to see some of that stuff slow down. I mean, a big part of CPI is housing and how the housing market had been so hot and now we're starting to see that taper off. So that's gonna be a count, that's gonna be kind of counter to some of these other inflationary forces that are going on. And I think the Fed's gonna have an uphill battle of trying to get inflation where they want it to be. So um, looking at the consumer is something the Fed also pays a close attention to on slide number six. And we've got the retail sales information and you can see it was really strong in, uh, you know, late 2017 and into 2018. And then in December, in the holiday season, when they expected it to be so high, it really dropped off. And that was a, a shock to everyone. It might have been partly because of the shutdown. You know, that might have caused some uncertainty for some people. But it took everyone by surprise. And it's, it's possible that that wasn't an entirely accurate number. I think a lot of people are questioning whether or not, um, you know, that's really going to be the case. But we've, we can see it's rebounded a little bit. March was up 3.6% year over year for retail sales. And then consumer confidence is another um, is another gauge that people look at. And I mean, just for historical reference, I mean, we're sitting at 124 right now for consumer confidence, and the average is about 95 going back in time to when this started in 85. So we're really strong confidence-wise. Consumers are feeling very comfortable spending money, and it's it's been really strong for the economy. Do you think that January 19 dip was again the government shutdown? Yes. That drove that. Yes. Definitely. It, it, it impacted, you could see the stock market took a huge dive. And anytime you see the stock market start to take a dive like that, a lot of times you'll see CPI. It's kind of a softer measure. You know, it's a survey that they give people. So it's just how people are feeling. It's not necessarily based on, on hard data, but it, it, it is reflected. You can definitely see the impact there on the data. Okay, then the next slide we have, you know, I'll kind of go over this real briefly. Um, the LEI, the leading economic indicators, this is something that one of the factors that we look at when we're trying to predict if there's going to be a recession. And it takes 10 different um, leading indicators in the market and puts them together into an index. And um, you can see it's kind of it's kind of dipped negative a little bit um, last couple months, but now it's come back to the positive. So we're kind of on a downward trend, but not, you know, we're not in the woods yet. On a year over year basis, this is up 3.1%. So we're still very strong for LEI. So we're not, we're not, not a cause for concern. Um, the Chicago Fed National Activity Index is a little broader index, and um, the three-month moving average has moved into the negative. So it, here again, it's something we're watching very closely, but this is also very volatile. So um, you know, although it is something worth, it is noteworthy, we're, not, we're still not expecting a recession in the near future. So this could easily reverse. A quick question, why do they pick Chicago Fed National Activity versus New York Fed versus Los Angeles versus Because they compiled this data for us, so that's why we use it, because they, they put it together. I guess not just looking at middle America. 
yeah, they look at they look at the national activity. They look at everyone. They do the research. So if New York had a metric, if they did this, we would probably look at that as well. Okay, they don't. Yeah. Chicago. Doing this is Chicago. Yeah, this is, and the St. Louis Fed does quite a bit of you know research as well, and that's actually where we you know we get this from the St. Louis Fed, but Chicago Fed is the source of the data. So. Thank you. Sure. So they compile that for us, and the next slide we have housing, and you know for those of you who own a home, you've probably seen the value go up. Um, you know, quite a bit. For those of you who are looking to buy a home like me, it's not hasn't been as pretty of a situation. Um, but housing starts. Um, you know, they were they're pretty. They've been actually pretty stable. You know, considering what's been going on, we've got um, 1.14 million um, multifamilies were pretty flat. Single families were down a little bit. Um, and then the Case Shiller is a, is a helpful index on the right. It shows the you can see that the trend. This is still positive growth. 3.6% year over year. But this looks at 20 major cities around the country, and San Diego is one of them. Um, so 3.6 for the national average, but I just want to point that San Diego's lower growth is two point, it's about 2% as opposed to the national average. So we're, we've seen more, we saw a hotter growth earlier, and now we're seeing more of a slowdown than the national average overall. So yeah, so interest rates have definitely had, had an impact. I mean, we're seeing a lot of people kind of with affordability issues, and we're also seeing the impact of higher interest rates has kind of slowed things down. How much do you think the new uh, tax code will impact home sales when you can't deduct as much interest? Yeah, I think that has an impact in places like California and New York, mm -hmm. especially. So I think, you know, I think it's having an impact on the margin. I mean, you know, millennials are starting to buy houses. So we're seeing some of that get offset. But I think I think for, you know, for some people that does make a difference in whether they want to buy or rent. I see some homes in, in New York on the East Coast are definitely sitting longer in the market. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, high tax states are having an issue with yeah. that. Well, question I've noticed in this area and in the city of San Diego, uh, high rises going up left and right, they're all rentals mm -hmm. for millennials. Millenn millennials aren't buying, they're renting. Right, right. So, I, and I don't know, the multifamily housing, is that single family housing? There's nothing to do with apartments? The multifamily housing is going to be apartments and things like that. So. We've got tons of them built all yeah. over this county. Yeah. That's right, they are. Um, and we are starting to see millennials start to start families and buy homes because that, that's a major driver I mean they're starting families later than previous generations but now that they're getting into their 30s they are starting to actually we're starting to see a little bit of a move into home ownership it kind of depends on the market whether they can afford it or not if you're in somewhere like San Francisco it might be tough and you might be stuck renting um, but it just it just depends on on where in the country it is and what the, what the individual situation is okay and then I'm kind of gonna gloss over I think manufacturing a little bit unless you want me to get into that you know, it's kind of been steady eddy there. And then um, GDP on slide number 10. This is showing last year's D GDP information. We actually had um, first quarter GDP came out. It's not on this slide yet because it's, it's pretty new information. But it came out really strong, 3.2%. That was way above expectations. I do want to couch a little bit that some of that was noise um, regarding imports because there's been an inventory buildup because it was a little bit of, you might have heard of some of the things going on down at the border with um, people importing auto parts and things like that as much as they can because they were concerned about a border shutdown and things like that. So we've seen inventory start to rise up. So that kind of manipulated the number a little bit and made it a little artificially high. But if you take that out, it's about two and a half percent. So right about where people were expecting. So I think, you know, the economy is still in really good shape despite, you know, some of the noise going on. So I think we're still in really good shape for the time being. Okay, then the next slide talks about what the Federal Reserve is doing. I'm kind of going to Unless you want me to get into this one, I might, I might kind of skip over this as well. Um, the Federal Reserve is just kind of letting their letting their balance sheet roll off a little bit, and that's kind of expected to end in September. So it's going down to about 3.5 trillion, and we're pretty close to where the Fed on the right there. We've got the federal funds rates. Um, the longer run target is the green line, and the gray line is um, the federal funds effective rate. So that reflects the hikes that the Fed has been doing. So you can see those lines are getting closer together. So it means the Fed is close to its target, and they might be done hiking rates. So right close. Done. So that all has an impact on yields, and this slide is probably the most relevant of all for your portfolio. Um, you can see on the, the bond yields um, going back to 2017, you can see that rates have been going up, but they've also been getting closer together in terms of the difference between a two-year and a ten-year. Um, the two-year is the is the purple line, the five-year is the gray line, and the green line is the ten-year. So you can see there's not a lot of difference between those at all. So we're looking at about 2.3% for both the two-year and the five-year. We're even seeing a little bit of an inversion. Sometimes the two-year has a higher yield than the five-year. 
So when you see an inversion, you might have heard you're supposed to, that there's a recession coming and you should go long and you should invest longer term. Um, and you know we don't feel that this inversion is extreme enough yet. When you look back historically, typically you're gonna have a longer term inversion before you really need to start to be worried. You know, there have been times, you know, I think the Fed stopped hiking rates just in time. You know, if they had been doing more hikes, that might have been problematic for the economy. But I think they're, they're just being really careful right now. And so you can also see the rates have, you know, kind of peaked up in December and then they've been coming down ever since. So that means that we've been buying all through this period when we've been getting cash for the account. And now all those assets are getting, are going up in value because yields are coming down. So. Okay, can uh, you have some bring them up? The Republic. Yeah. Okay, questions about the economy before we move on to your account? We'll talk about the portfolio. Okay, great. So I just want to review the objectives when we're investing on um, page 14. Uh, we're looking, the first priority is going to be safety when we're investing. The second is liquidity to make sure we have um, enough cash flow to meet your, your upcoming cash needs. And then the third consideration is to get the best yield we can get considering all those other factors first. So we're managing currently to the Bank of America Merrill Lynch one to three year U.S. Treasury Index. And we're purchasing high quality bonds consistent with your policy and California code. And so we have a, a, we have a compliance template that we include with your monthly statement and your quarterly report. And this is generated um, by our system for your review for the committees. But I just want to emphasize that we have a very um, we have a very strong compliance system. And so anytime I'm doing a trade, if there's pre-trade and post-trade compliance, we have a dedicated staff that's monitoring that all the time. So, um, so this is always being monitored, even though we report to you once a month. Okay, then we can talk about the characteristics of the portfolio, which is, I think, a key slide for everyone. Um, in the middle, we've got your portfolio. On the left, we've got the benchmark. And on the right, we have your portfolio from the previous quarter. Um, so I'm going to focus on the middle column because that's, that's your portfolio um, characteristics. Um, the duration, we were talking about that earlier. So it's sitting at about 1.72 versus the benchmark at 1.81. So we're about 92% of the benchmark here. And that's moved higher since this was printed. This is a little you know, from the end of March. So it's been about a month since then. Um, the purchase yield, you can see, has been moving higher. Um, the previous quarter, it was sitting at 2.28% or up to 2.41%. So that should continue to... Um, should continue to rise if we have lower yielding securities maturing off. Um, the market yield had a pretty big move, and this is just the value of the portfolio based on the market price. So, you know, prices and yields move inversely. So, um, when you see prices go up, then the yield comes down. So, you can see the value of your portfolio increase. Um, so, it went from uh, 2.65 down to 2.42. So, that's positive for your market value. Um, average quality is very high, it's double A on the average. And the market value went from 48.7 million to 55.4 million. I, I wish I could take credit for all that, but part of it was <laughs> contributions. So it was about $6 million that was contributed over that period. Um, but $630,000 of that um, is coming from interest and also mark to market gains that are unrealized gains and losses. So in this case, gains because we had the value of your portfolio go up. And I, I just want to emphasize that over the quarter, new purchases were yielding anywhere from 25 to 3%. So that's, been, that's caused the purchase yield to, to rise over time. And you, you hold all your securities to maturity, so the purchase yield is really what you're going to be getting over time. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Did we receive one of these December 31st of 2019? 18. 18. 19? Oh, of 18, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, yeah, we, we over. haven't seen a year yet with you, or have we seen a year with you? I don't believe we've seen a year fully invested. Okay. When we when we hit the year mark, we started out with the number and the uh, district has slowly provided contributions. So we haven't seen a one year fully invested mark mm -hmm. as of yet. Okay. But you'll be sure to show us when we get there. Yes. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So, so the real question we can ask Wes is, could you have done better or not? <laughs> After paying your friend. Sure. The bottom line is, what do you make the most amount of money? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And we, we can talk about um, performance as well. Um, yeah, we will talk about yeah, we, we, okay. yeah, we can. We can oh, I'm sure you've done awesome. Yeah, no, we'll and we'll we have, yeah, we have our report card included here, so we can, we can certainly talk about that. the best for last. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a dramatic <laughs> ending. Tris yeah. Mala, I have a quick question. Would, would there be a way on that um, table on page 16 uh -huh. to, to reflect how we did net in 
additional investments. So this shows total market value, but like you said, six six million of that difference between the portfolio and compared to last quarter, mm -hmm. six of the seven million was just additional investments. Sure. So I'm not sure where maybe it's in subsequent pages that reflects how how you actually did with the money we gave you, not just that we gave you more money. Okay, so yeah, performance is going to um, reflect that, you know, how we did, you know, relative to the to the index. And I think going forward, going this isn't going to be as dramatic because I think some of the contributions have have kind of waned off, so right. it's going to be we'll a little better. But yeah, but yes. I mean, just you know, for your reference, about six hundred thirty thousand dollars of this is the result of interest income, and then yeah. mark to market it's, gains. Is there an easier way to you know that in your head? Mm -hmm. But there's no. Is there a better way on this table to show that? Yeah, I'll check. Uh, I'll check with Kara. Through, I would um, think that probably through the monthly statements because that shows where you were the previous month plus the contribution. And we can just send you a few of those yeah. in a PDF, yeah. Yeah. like the um, sure. portfolio sure. summary sure. slides, yeah. maybe uh, for the last three or four months so you can see the difference. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't want do us to have to do mental arithmetic, yeah. uh -huh. arithmetic in our head and sure. page to page. Right. You can have it right on the summary we'll slide. We'll send you uh, maybe the last six just portfolio yeah. summaries okay. in a PDF. Yeah, I think the monthly statement lays that all out yes. um, in more detail. Mm -hmm. This is more just a you know for for presentation purposes. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I would say on the average, it's been yeah. about a hundred thousand dollars a month has been interest, like accrued interest right. that the portfolio has earned, and the remainder of that is just mark to market gains. Now it's important to note that the market's going to move all around, so those are unrealized. You're not necessarily going to realize them, you know, if you're not making sales, which right. you know we don't typically do in this portfolio. So. I think the main thing to focus on is your interest income. So that's sitting at about three hundred thousand okay. on this. So, and that's definitely on the monthly statement. So I think that that would be a good place to right. to take a look at that. And then we can look at how how we've been investing the portfolio, what types of sectors um, we've been focusing on. And you can see it's a diverse. Um, these these donut charts show um, the previous quarter on the right and the current quarter on the left. And there's really not a lot of major changes here. Uh, we had an increase with some of the funds that we were getting in. We were purchasing auto asset-backed securities to a large degree because that was one of the areas where we really saw good value. Um, you know, we, we saw, you know, when the market was skittish in December, we really saw corporate bond, you know, yields go up quite a bit. So we took advantage of that. But now, you know, we're starting to see um, more things like, like auto, auto asset-backs were a little bit more advantageous. So we, we focused on that. And we purchased some negotiable CDs that went up a little bit, and then um, yeah, exactly. And then some agencies. Our agencies actually went down a little bit. We de-emphasized those because the spread on this is like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac types of securities, and, and those the spreads on those the diff, the premium that you were getting paid to invest in them kind of went down. So we weren't focusing on those as much. But um, but we'll talk about that when we talk about the investment policy as well because there's an, it has to do with that as well. Uh, the next slide shows the issuers that we're investing the district's portfolio into. You can see about two-thirds of the portfolio is invested in U.S. government securities. So that's either U.S. Treasuries or Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or Federal Home Loan Bank. So very high quality. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, do we uh, do anything with the County of San Diego? You, you do. Yeah. I believe you have a slice of between 5 and $6 million dollars yeah. Yeah. invested with uh, the San Diego County Investment Pool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so we have the consolidated information as well, um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that um, so you can see it as a whole picture. If but this is just, if you want to just jump ahead very quickly to, to page 27, you can see that 7.3% of the district's portfolio is invested in 7.1% um, as of March 31st in the San Diego County Investment Pool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You okay. And you've got late as well, so like, so there's plenty of liquidity there in the late in the late balance. Okay, so for the issuers, I just want to emphasize here mainly that, uh, this is slide 18 that I'm on, uh, that when we're buying corporate credit, we make sure to make sure it's very diversified, it's very high quality, and we're not putting too many eggs in any one basket. And we're making sure we're diverse across both issuers and different industries. We don't want to pile all into financials, for example. We're going to make sure we've got, we've got a balance and that we're buying the highest quality out of each type of security. So the credit quality page talks about the ratings that we have in the portfolio. And okay, quick question. Yeah. I don't have my advocates here. Uh huh. Uh, for instance, Royal Bank of Canada, your yeah. point nine two of our portfolio. Yes. What so is that in dollars and cents? About one percent. So if your portfolio is about fifty five million, uh, so we can look at the holdings, for example, and you can always see how much we have of a given security. So we have that page slide twenty eight is where it starts. 
Yeah, so it's about a half a million exactly if you just do the math. But um, but you can also see if you want to see when it matures and you know we have all this information okay. here so that you can find it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, but I, I just I do want to point out one thing on the quality page. You can see the portfolio is very high quality. Most of the assets are double A um, rated because the U.S. government's rated double A plus by S and P. So all these ratings are based on the S and P rating structure. Uh, so you're going to see there's a non-rated component, and some of those are negotiable CDs that don't have ratings, but they're backed by FDIC, and so those are legacy securities. And then some of them are asset-backed securities that we've purchased that are AAA rated by Moody's and or Fitch, but just don't happen to have an S&P rating. So they're still very high quality, and I would say all of your securities are the equivalent of single A or higher. They're all very high quality. Okay, um, duration distribution shows um, the maturity um, schedule for your, for your portfolio. So you, the gray bar is the benchmark that we're measured against. And you can see that's strictly a one to three. So they only have one to three year securities. Um, with your portfolio, you can see we've got about a quarter of the portfolio maturing in one year or less. So we're always making sure that we have maturities coming due so we have um, funds if you need liquidity or if you want, if we can reinvest it at higher rates, for example. We've got quite a bit of the portfolio coming due in the next year or so. So how do you select your benchmark? Like what? It's the oh. ICE, the AML. What's that? So when yeah. we began our relationship with you, Jason and I came out and had a kickoff meeting, and we went through a benchmark study. And one of the things that we did was that we looked at all of the portfolio characteristics. So you, you only have a couple of benchmarks that are available to you, uh, kind of a zero to three, a one to three, and a sh the short-term bond, which is the one to five-year benchmark. And we looked at the return characteristics, how many quarters and years they, they had been negative and or positive, and what would potentially be the, the director's um, appetite for loss and whether or not they wanted to sell securities. And I think the reason we came to the conclusion of the one to three year benchmark was that we wanted to begin with more of a buy hold strategy. And if we used the zero to five or one to five year benchmark, we would have to sell and trade quite a bit more. And for the first, you know, the initial period, that was maybe not the, the uh, natural desire of the district. Yeah, it might be my ignorance. I just don't understand what the, because I've never heard of the ISBA, except for mm -hmm. talking with you, um, the ISBA ML, and, and, and you said we only have a few benchmarks that we can select. Public agencies, as a result of California government state code, really, the investable universe for you is so small because you can only invest in fixed income securities rated A or better between zero and five years. Um, and, and ICE, what maybe what you're um, noticing is there's been a name change. And Jenny, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, ICE acquired um, the benchmarks. Um, so Bank of America Merrill Lynch <coughs> is a legacy namesake, but ICE, ICE I believe purchased them, so their, their name is on it now along with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. And the SEC no, requires us to label it as such, yeah. so it looks different. So I guess it's, <coughs> it's like a mutual fund that's performing at 2.8% since our... It's a non, it's, it's, it's a passive index, so it's oh, basically okay. maintained by ICE and Bank of, Bank of America, and so they just have a, a, a group of securities. It's not investable, it's not something you can purchase, yeah. right. but it's something that we use as a measurement. So every month they rebalance, so at the end of the month, they take all their securities so that like are less than a year. So it's like the agency NASDAQ or something. It's, Correct. It's like, in yeah, some ways. Okay. Yeah, it's like a it's like a me, like an S and P five hundred or something. Mm -hmm. But you know, only it's not about like you can buy the S and P five hundred, but you can't actually buy this index. Okay. You, know, you could buy something. You know, you could have a manager manage it similar, okay. which is sort of what we're doing. But we're also augmenting it with different things to take advantage of what California code allows for, but still being very conservative. Okay. So, so Wes, it's important to think of it as like a bogey or a target. If we're way above the benchmark, we're probably taking on too much risk. If we're falling way below the benchmark, we should be taking on more risk. And so it's a, a target that, that we invest to to kind of show and remain disciplined. Mm -hmm. That answers my question. Thank you. Great. All right. Then the next slide is, I think, the one we've been waiting for here. It's the investment performance on slide 22. And you can see um, since inception, since April of 2018, so it's been almost a year. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, maybe next time we have a quarterly meeting, um, it's going to have a one-year performance information, but we were um, we've um, returned 3.13 percent versus the benchmark of 2.88. And I just want to emphasize that this number is including your interest income. It's also including the unrealized gains. 
because of the market. So this, you may see this look really low sometimes or really high, both the benchmark and this data, but a lot of times it's just because of interest rate movements in the market. So because interest rates came down and your portfolio gained value, this looks really high. So it's 3.13% on a total return basis. And over the last three months, 1.2% um, for the portfolio versus the benchmark of 0.98. So it beat the, the benchmark by about a quarter of a percent. And this does not reflect any of the fees That's or right. costs associated with Yeah, so investment. for fees, we'd have to deduct about, I think about maybe 0.09 or so okay. off of that. So we'd still be beating the benchmark, but by, you know, by maybe 10 or 15. Right. Okay, then the next slide has a reporting account. And this is the um, information that you were asking about. It includes the county, the San Diego County pool balances, which is about 5.3 million, and then the lake balances, which were about 13.3 million as of the end of March. And it looks like this balance came down a little bit from 23 million down to 18 million. Part of that might have been transferred over to Chandler. You know, not, there, was, there was some cash movements there. But you can see that the rate of the purchase yield on that has been going up as well. It's gone from 2.3% to 2.43%. I think there might have been a question about the, the difference in the late yield and the portfolio yield. Um, yeah, that was one of the concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, when you're investing a one to three year strategy, you've got some legacy securities that maybe were purchased when yields were lower, maybe yields were 1%. And so those are still held in the portfolio. And so your, your portfolio is longer term. And so when rates came up so fast, LAIF came up higher than a lot of longer term portfolios. And we're also seeing the shape of the yield curve. We're seeing shorter yields are higher than five year yields, for example. So that's all having an impact on, on the portfolio. But over, over time, you should see that a longer term strategies should out, out yield LAIF over time. Typically, when, when you get an inversion in the yield curve, that's usually temporary. And it's usually a sign that you wanna be investing longer. And the average life of LAIF, when you think about that, is about one year. And so um, if rates fall, yeah. weight is going to come down very significantly. Very it's going to come down faster. Quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite a bit shorter than your portfolio. So your portfolio is about 1.7. Late is going to be about like 0.5. So, yeah, so it's going to be more sensitive to interest rate movements. If the Fed were ever, you know, we're going to cut rates, you'd see late go down really fast. You'd go, see you see go down super fast compared to your portfolio. Okay, then the next slide shows the consolidated information, or I'm sorry, the next slide shows the um, reporting account pie charts, and you can see um, LAFE is about 71% of the portfolio, and the county pool is about 28%. That's slide 24, I'm sorry. And then the consolidated data on slide 26 shows all of your holdings all put together. So we've got, um, you can see that the average duration is a little bit shorter because it has a lot of the pool information, the LAFE and the, and the county pool included. So it's gone from about 1.16 to about 1.3. And the purchase yield's been increasing from 2.29 to about 2.41. It's very high quality. And you can see overall your portfolio has increased by about $2 million in market value. Okay, and the next slide I think is really helpful the sector distribution, because this shows the entire picture. I think we looked at this earlier. But it shows that you've got about 18% in LAFE, so that's liquid investments, and you've also got the county pool, about 7%. So you've got about 25% that's that's in liquid pools, and then the remainder is, is invested in, in a variety of securities um, in, your, in your custom portfolio. Okay, then the remainder of the report is just the holdings and the transactions that we did over the quarter. So. I'd be happy to take any questions about about any of this uh, before we move on to the investment policy. Oh, I'm good with this uh, now, um, mainly because it's been a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. But I, I understand we're going to continue having these meetings a bit quarterly or every six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, frequency, but uh, regularly. Okay. I think um, we're happy to come out every quarter, but I think you notice a. a more of a difference when we come out like twice a year yeah, I because agree. you can see a, a more noticeable change mm -hmm. um, as, as the portfolio seasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where do you have to come out from? 
We're right here in San Diego. Believe oh. it or not, Jenny lives in uh, Rancho Penasquitos, and I live in South Ocean Side, right where the city oh, ends. Perfect. So we're like, <laughs> we're happy, that's why I say we're happy to come out anytime. Yeah, we'll come back really out for, us. for board uh, for next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it's very easy for us. And, and we uh, are in front of Anthony and, and Wes uh, quite a bit as well. Sure. Who's so, Wes? Did he fall? <laughs> <laughs> Six months worse for me. And then I would even say, um, and we can talk about it next time. I think in the beginning, six months is good, but we might even want to go once a year and, and you know, like right, sure. long term. So. And next time, what we'll do is we'll email the presentation to make sure it's up, up, up on the screen. All right, great. Yeah, that sounds great. So I also, we brought along um, some proposed changes to the investment policy. And so that's this memo. Um, Wes, and then we also have a redlined um, version of the investment policy, so you can see what it would look like if it were implemented into the policy. And so the first change that we wanted to recommend was just sort of a, an enhancement, really. Um, we wanted on page five of the policy. Do we just that? yes, yeah. yes. Should it's this stapled one? item. Oh, yeah, right. it's, it's in your right hand there. Okay. There you go. Um, so look, yeah, so page, page five. five is the first um, proposed change, and this is really okay. just a clarification. Just, we, we don't, I mean, we, we would assume that credit quality minimums are at the time of purchase, but this just spells it out in the policy. So that it's, um, the code assumes that, but we just want to, we just want to make it clear that, that you're not going to be forced sellers if something got downgraded. You'd have the option to hold it if it has a short time of maturity, um, for example, and you wouldn't want to be forced to sell into a, into a stressed situation. Okay, the second change that we were requesting is more just housekeeping, and this was, reflected by a change to California code that took effect in 2017. So California code clarified that anytime you specify long-term ratings, that it's the rating category, meaning that um, a single A investment could be rated A minus or A plus or just single A. Um, so they just, that's just a clarification really. It's not, um, it's not a major change. Um, the third change that we're recommending is, is I think probably the most important that we have here. Um, in the policy on page um, page six of the policy, mm -hmm. it looks like there's a there's a limitation for 10% of the portfolio in one in right. any one federal agency. Our recommendation is to increase that. The federal agencies are very um, very safe liquid investments, and so we would recommend um, maybe 25% of the portfolio mm -hmm. per agency. I mean, you still want. I think mm -hmm. it's important to still have some diversification amongst the agencies, but. Um, but typically, kind of what we see with local agencies is we is we usually um, we usually see a little bit higher than ten percent. So we wanted to recommend a higher higher limit for that. Any questions about that one? Wes, do you have questions on that? Change that from ten percent to twenty five percent. So I'm pretty sure that was sort of a typo in the original edit. Oh, okay. Um, so it should be um, more than what they're recommending now. So yeah. <coughs> okay. Great. Yeah, so yeah, 25% would be great. That would give us a little more breathing room to be able to purchase. Because that made us locked into like almost existing purchases and we weren't yes. able to do much more. Right, we weren't <laughs> able to buy as many agencies actually um, because we were limited by the 10%. Yeah, so um, we, had, we had talked about that before but we wanted to wait for the annual update to come around to make the correction. Sure, okay, great. Yeah, so that would be a, that would be a key change um, that we'd recommend. Um, another change that we had, um, recommended was to the commercial paper section of the authorized investments. It looks like it's also on page six. Um, yeah, under commercial paper, so it's section 6.5 right in the middle of the page. And this is just, this is here again, this isn't something that necessarily is a big deal, but it's just nice to have the clarification. A lot of commercial paper, um, most commercial paper ha does have short-term ratings. Um, and sometimes the issuer has a longer-term rating, but sometimes they don't. So. Um, so what we like to say, in, in, gen in general, when we're looking at credit quality of, of commercial paper, we're looking at the parent and want them to be at least single A. But if they're not explicitly rated, um, we wanted to include the language that if there are long-term ratings, they must be single A. But in general, we're going to look for companies that are single A or higher credit quality. We're just going to be doing very high quality commercial paper in general. So that's just kind of a housekeeping item as well. Um, Another change that we wanted to recommend is to the asset back section. This is another change that just happened in California mm -hmm. Code, so this is very recent. Um, it just took effect this year, January 1st. So um, there, there's kind of a, a gray area in California Code regarding some of the ratings on asset back securities. So when you buy an asset back security, it has to be at least double A rated at the security level. But California Code had an additional requirement for A rated by the issuer. 
Um, so we interpreted that to mean that we would look at the parent, but, it, but in reality, a lot of the issuers don't actually have a rating. So they cleaned that up in code, and they took out that issuer rating. But we're still going to be looking for very high quality issuers. But um, but in case the issuer doesn't have a rating, we just wanted we didn't want to limit you versus code. Uh, but we're still going to be only buying securities that are double A AA or higher. And in practice, quite frankly, we've just been buying triple A. I've never seen us buy a single AA, a double A security in the in asset back land. So those are very high quality securities, and they did quite well during the crisis. Actually, they were a good diversifier. Okay, then on the next page, eight of the policy red line um, has our next proposed change. And California code allows you to have up to 20% in a given money market fund. So uh, we were just going to recommend that maybe, um, if, you, if you feel comfortable with that, that if you wanted to raise it um, from 10 to 20% for a money market fund. I mean, it, I, I don't foresee that we would have it unless you had a bunch of liquidity link, you know, unless we had cash, you know, mm. from a contribution or something like that. But it just kind of raises the limit. Um, so so our current policy already allows for 20%, but the, the, you're suggesting that we take out the, the line that says no more than 10% of the total portfolio will be invested in with one institution? Right, so you can have 20% in money market mutual funds, but only 10% per fund. So we're just recommending that that, that be removed. Um, not that we foresee that we're gonna be putting a lot of money market funds, but just, just in general, if you have cash, um, to be more consistent with code is, is would be the thought there. But it's, it's not necessary, um, it's just, you know, if you feel comfortable so with that. So typically where you see this come into play is maybe with like a very large county, perhaps the mm -hmm. county of San Diego have a lot of liquidity sitting around, uh -huh. it almost, it would very rarely in, in most cases even apply to the district, but mm -hmm. it's really in keeping congruent with the California government state code. Mm -hmm. It kind of saves you from having, you know, if you give us, you know, a cash contribution or something, it saves it from having a compliance violation if it happens to be over 10% or something like, you know what I mean? Even though we're, we're going to be investing it. So we just, it's just kind of a housekeeping mm -hmm. item as well. And I don't believe we're anywhere near 10% in the money market currently. We have yeah, and we keep it we keep it very low in general. You know, when we're investing funds, you might see a little bit of a balance, but then you know, in general, we, we try to keep it under one percent. So in practice, it's going to be very low. Yeah, so we're talking about one percent, and we have a ten percent limit. Yeah, so yes, you have a ten percent limit, so it's not you know, it's just you know, it's just if if you like, you could change that and you know, just be more consistent with code. But it's not it's not critical or anything like that. Okay, and then there's just a couple others um, that we wanted to bring um, to your attention. I'm on page eleven. And we're talking about, this is just sort of a, this is language that I just like to have in the policy just to prevent there being contradictions in the policy. I, I don't think you have any contradictions. I think it's it's a really clean, well-written policy. But um, but just in case changes are made and somebody, you know, and it doesn't get changed everywhere, I like to put um, that there's a 5% limit per issuer for government securities supranationals, and you name them all, unless it's otherwise specified. So that's just kind of, and here again, this isn't something that is critical to do, but it's just kind of a best practices thing, so. Okay, and then another one that um, I wanted to bring your attention is on callables. There's a 20% limit on callables, which is, um, it's, it's prudent to have a limit on callables, so you're not investing very heavily. Um, we, have, we have a number of corporate bonds that we've um, wanted to purchase that have a call one month before maturity, and technically they fall in as callable. So um, we were wondering if, if you would consider increasing the limit to maybe 30% from 20% so that we could buy those corporates. Um, we're not gonna be you know, loading the boat with callables or anything. And, and in practice, I wouldn't even necessarily consider those to be callable, but it's it has to do with government regulations, um, capital with banks and things like that. So they, a lot of them have like a one month call right before maturity. I know, we'll hear that. Okay, all right, that would be, that would be very helpful. And then we just added the make whole call to the glossary. Some of the corporates have a make whole call provision. We don't we don't consider that to be a callable feature. So it'll just take place if there's a corporate action or something like that. So they're a little less less common. So those are the those are the recommendations we have. Do you have any questions about? Can I clarify anything for you? Or? And I've had a chance to look over all these policy changes. I just wanted to bring it to the committee mm -hmm. so that you can give me feedback from your questions you may have. <laughs> when do you anticipate this one of the full board? Uh, May 15th. You wear the eyes of May. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Jenny and I plan to be at that meeting. So if there are yeah. questions, um, 
if you would like us to potentially uh, put these like onto a PowerPoint slide, we're happy to do that, whatever sure. direction you'd like to. Yeah, if you want to change the format a little bit out of the memo and make it more presentation friendly, we can certainly. Yeah, we'll probably do a PowerPoint out of the Okay. Okay. Um, Wes, is the item just going to be the policy issue or so is it going to be the investment update? Yeah, and I was thinking, would we have an annual review by the May 15th meeting? Didn't we start in May or in April? We started April 30th. Um, we, yeah, we, we could potentially have it ready. It, it just depends on data okay. and um, when it's available to us. But if we, I, it, I will find out. So if you, if you can't let me know, okay. I'll just assume it might be around the same mm -hmm. time that it worked out well. But mm -hmm. that if sounds not, great. we'll just be communicating. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds great. So then we'll add in this one slide for the um, investment policy potential changes. Take care of that. Any other questions for us? Okay, Great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to send you the monthly summary. Okay. To keep it up for the last six months. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great. Thanks, 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You guys are more than welcome nice to stay for the budget you portion if you like. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you, much. Thank you sir. Yeah. 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 Nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Hi, Jenny. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Wes. Nice to meet you. Thank 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 Good. What you think of last night? You should watch it. Don't tell me. Okay. I won't see it. Now. Several I people it. were talking in the. I'm like, oh, oh, no, oh, no. Oh. You gotta. I'm so. You gotta get with it. I've friend. only watched the last episode of the previous season. Oh, oh you haven't seen any of this? Oh, you haven't seen please. any of that stuff? Oh, yeah. Crazy. How do you expect to not hear things? I, uh, it's your own fault. It is. It yeah. Is. Mm -hmm. But when I last week, she was tired or busy and just like, I have to be fully awake and focusing that because this show requires <laughs> concentration. <laughs> yeah, which I can't which I agree with. I thought last night's episode was great. Should I leave while you guys just No, leave? that's all I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <sighs> but I didn't watch two movies this week and so I was busy. Then you're busy. Did, not related to the show itself, at least the content. Did you think that the the quality as far as it's just I know it, it was filmed at night, but yeah. it just was like dark. way too dark. It was way yeah. too dark. I kept asking my wife, I'm like, it, it, very is dark. this our is our TV broken? Well, Maybe <laughs> realize I need a TV with better contrast. No, I got I had some like ghosting and stuff, but just uh, yeah, that was that was that was probably that was disappointing so because I had an old old 46 inch LCD TV that we recently got rid of because you know in those old LCDs the blacks are gray anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see anything dark scene and I got a new TV that's not the highest quality it's not the OLED but it's yeah. a LED and it's got way better black contrast so that helped tremendously but it was still hard to see. it was still hard to see. yeah yeah that was disappointing just because I mean you know you're gonna have an hour well, yeah. hour long plus battle you want it to be in high definition yeah you know, see every every right. slash I, mean, I guess it you know the episode was called the long night yeah yeah no <laughs> so, I mean I mean, I know. it makes sense yeah. but it's just there's some like, they emotionally could have, draining though. They could have left, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they could have left the night nice part up, up to my imagination. I would yeah. figure that out. Yeah. They, exactly. It could have been more lit. <laughs> yeah. Even if it was fire that was lighting it or something, you know. But uh, yeah, my wife and I said the same thing. It was hard to see. And there were several times right. where I was kind of like, "Is that so and so?" She goes, "No, that's that's the wrong yeah. guy." I'm like, oh, "I don't." Yeah. Know. They all have long hair and beards, so it's hard. I to did. Know. I did correctly pick in our office pool. <laughs> Um, oh, really? yeah. uh, don't don't say anything about it. <laughs> I'm just starting to binge on it. I don't want to hear anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. So. I, 
Viking does. It's this game with Now you moved up to two dollars. <laughs> I'm assuming so. Well, yeah, I grew a little fish here. I see yeah. that. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, 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 I'm trying to Mike's still working on it. Going, <laughs> so it this is a week. Yeah. It's, it's like going. Year, My wife says he's got to go. I'm trying to switch. No, he's a he's a facial hair surgeon. His wife doesn't like it, so I encourage him to keep it. Yeah, he he calls it the good fighter. We'll call us back to order. And we'll move on to item number two, uh, review the draft budget. Yeah, we'll try to make up some, some time there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's so, long yeah be great. so they took an hour, so I'm just going to take half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're always supposed to take Maybe it's your best ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's not we had a cool session. I feel like we've been on the budget. Well. I feel like, <laughs> how much new, new stuff would there be? That's right. And that's what this is really going to show you. Um, okay, so Mike, before I start, packets, go ahead. I'm going to add more to your packets, unfortunately. So. Mm -hmm. Here's the presentation. The, second page that, the, second section. the first two pages are a slide that I have that's not, it's kind of modified from your budget, so I just want to give you that so you have it. The salaries and benefits page, I have version one and version two. Uh, Director Martin, this is for you as well. This is the presentation, and that modified slide is on the front. <coughs> and you want to finish this ahead of time, yeah. Well, that's just my presentation, so I just want to, if you want to follow along in those, you can. The rest of it's the, the detail to it. I always do everything. I'm not hiding anything. Yeah. Okay. That one? Okay. <laughs> okay, let's sign in. Hey, we won transparency awards. That's right. Oh, that's <laughs> good. I hate to see what you're going to have to do when they bring the budget. We go, now you got to cut 20 million. How are you going to do this all over again? I want to make Mike do that time. <laughs> easy in Excel. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> oh, just take a number. That'd be good to know it's easy. Thank you. Oh, I yeah. feel better. Just take a zero out of the back end of it. <laughs> now I feel much better. I love this. Yeah, you care, will you please? I don't know what that's about. I hope that it works. It just had to be repaired. The okay. average employee on their upper eight? Yes. <laughs> yep. That's <laughs> a succession <laughs> planning. I don't want to ask which one of you is replacing. So yes. I don't <laughs> Minimum wage. You wanted to save money on labor, right? Yeah, there you go. Right there. <clears throat> okay. Welcome to the committee meeting of the 29th. This is our fifth meeting. Mm -hmm. Count them. Five. Um, <clears throat> so, welcome back. 2020. The party page. Yeah, you're a genius. Mm -hmm. uh, look at I uh, thought you had See that. See that? Oh, you're right. I did have. Well, I mean, I do once, one per year is a limit to my creativity. Oh, that's it? That's all I got. Oh, <laughs> budget. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the agenda for today. First, we're going to go through wh where we've been, uh, what we've done so far. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about it. The last meeting on the, was the 15th. Uh, there were a few items requested by the committee. We're actually going to bring those forward first and then kind of go over those requests. And Anthony's <coughs> actually going to make it a little more exciting. We're going to pass the torch around this time. So it's not just me talking the whole time. I'm sure you're sick of hearing me talk. Oh, good. Yeah, see? I thought that would be exciting. <clears throat> then we'll talk about the operating changes. So we've presented the materials and services requests and salaries and benefits requests and all the operating requests to date. We're going to show you in this preliminary draft, which please keep in mind is a preliminary draft and it will change. I've just kind of compiled everything that we've put together so far. Still have a lot of QAQC to go through to get to the final version. That's the inside of the house, right? That's, <laughs> well, that's right. We're, we're all working together on this now. It becomes like a big team effort. We all get into it. Um, I actually passed out six copies today and said do some math checking, do some other checking. We're all getting into it now. Um, not that we're not always all in it, but yeah. we're <clears throat> So operating changes. So I'll show you what we presented before, what we're presenting now, and, and the difference between the two. And then we'll go into the capital changes. We actually just presented the capital at the last meeting. There have been a few changes since that meeting, and we'll show you those as well. And then we're going to do the five-year preview. So I have actually prepared the, the five-year projection for the reserves and the 10-year as well. But today we're just going to talk about the five-year preview. Um, and the, again, this is we compiled everything, put it together to give you a glimpse of what the five-year looks like. And then we'll talk about what we're going to do going from there. And this is where kind of the fun begins. And after that, we're actually going to talk about the cost of service study. We've, um, we haven't finalized the RFP yet, but we're on the verge of it. We're actually working on the timeline, so we'd like to walk you through some of the ideas we have as far as when the... Is that different than item three? Or no, that, 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 is, that, is, that is item three. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so we'll talk about the cost service timeline, and then we'll go into the next steps. So basically the next uh, committee meetings and budget or board meetings. Okay, so we've put together the previous numbers. We had the committee meeting on the 25th, talked about the budget calendar and actual versus budget for the last six years. And we had another meeting on the 14th where we went through the first review of the operating uh, requests. Then we had the 25th meeting, which is actually the fourth meeting because we had the preliminary kickoff meeting, which isn't listed here. Uh, and we talked about salaries and benefits and capital with James and Ed and everybody involved in that one. So now we're at today's meeting. So after the last meeting, we were supposed to incorporate the budget request item to develop the long range plan and prepare the draft budget and all three of those are what you have and what we'll be presenting today. Today we're gonna talk about the preliminary review of water purchases and sales, the review of the draft budget, and the cost of service study update. So, to get it started, it's going to be Anthony talking about. So these are the board requested mm -hmm. items from the previous meeting. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you want to summarize what they requested or start off slide by slide. I will just go slide by slide. So one of the questions from the last committee meeting was the value of the vehicle and equipment. Uh, the vehicles and equipment that we disposed of. Um, so this is a five-year snapshot of the disposition totals uh, for the vehicles and equipment. Um, so these can either be done through public surplus or through trade-in. Um, Dennis Bowman, our uh, warehouse supervisor, is really good about kind of vetting where the most value is going to be for these trade-ins. Um, so one thing to keep in mind with these is it's not necessarily a one-for-one. One. So if we buy a vehicle this year, it's the there's retrofitting that needs to be done to it. We have a lot of specialized equipment that needs to be added on. And then the vehicle that's being disposed of, there's a lot of decommissioning that needs to go on. So that's one important thing to keep in mind. One specific question that was asked oh, was about the value of the last Bacter truck that was sold, because we will be buying a new one of those. So that was in 2014-15, and we received $40,100. Good question, Mr. Chair. <coughs> question is, Someone paid $40,000 for our old Vector truck that we didn't think worked. Why would someone spend $40,000 on it? Mostly because they didn't want to spend $500,000 to buy a brand new one. <laughs> but, but it still worked. Still a useful life, I assume. Uh, sure, but it's it, those tend to be in the shop more than they're out on the street, and those don't get repaired internally. They have to be sent up to, I think it's Orange County or LA County, to actually be worked on. So it's a lot of downtime, it's a lot of staff. Carrying the vehicle back and forth, it just didn't make sense to hold on. It could be a that. tiny district, or even south of the border district. You know, whenever we dispose of a vehicle, it's always some type of a competitive process. We're either going to auctioneers or we're sure. going to trade-ins, and we're shopping around. No. I think the, the good thing I took from when I saw these numbers before the meeting is that I think we're milking almost all the value out of our vehicles. There's not much left of, of value to them when we dispose of them, so we're not getting hundreds of thousands of dollars, which to me would beg the question, why are we getting rid of it so soon? We're getting rid of it when there's very little value left. That was my question on $40,000. Why are we getting rid of it if it's still worth 40000 to somebody the way it is? I, I don't know. Maybe yeah. I think you answered it. Yeah, because yeah, we can't perform the work we need done right. with that vehicle. But someone else is going to do that. Right. They're going to be able to perform the work. But they wouldn't pay $40,000 for it. So another question from the last meeting was some reimbursements that we get for CIP projects. So we worked with engineering, they sent over some of these numbers. Uh, so here's five projects that we're receiving uh, reimbursements for with 100% certainty. So four of the five projects are related to the, the outfall. Um, so again, these are 100% certainty that we will receive these reimbursements. And just to add on to that, <coughs> so what we had done in, in this case, instead of netting it against the cost of the project, uh, we actually, because when you look at the reserve pages, those are the last uh, five or six pages of your budget, the inflows are up top and the outflows are down bottom, so the expenditures on projects are down bottom. It was easier for us to show these as inflows in the top part of that budget. So you'll see a new, <coughs> there's actually a new line in there for it since the board requested it, <coughs> that's called project reimbursements. So we've now included that in the reserve pages at the back of the budget. So, and I'll be showing these when I get to the, the end of the presentation. So the total budget for these five projects is about $19 million. So these 
the 4.7 million in reimbursements represents about 25% of our numbers. Okay, so uh, this is, now we're gonna go on to the operating changes. This is the original presentation of the operating budget with materials and services request, and you can see we had, uh, presented a 3.65% increase and added and talked about some of the highlighted changes there, why there were variances between those, those numbers. The, since then, we've had these changes to the operating budget. There was a request for an increase in the South Lake Dam fee. <clears throat> we've got the Hillside Property Assessment over here, which will be split between water and sewer, but that's going to be $9,000 increase in water. We're doing the GASB 75 reporting um, for the <coughs> new uh, GASB, well, 75 is based at the OPEB GASB. That's going to cost us $4,000 a year for the reports from the actuary. Um, and then we had the cost of service study. It'll be a one-time thing that we're doing this year. Uh, but we're estimating the cost of that at 45000 split between water and sewer. Explain the South Lake Dam fee. <clears throat> That's the State Division of Dams charges a, a fee to keep your dam current. So they, they raise their fees. But have we transferred that to the lessor? Lessee? No. That, that's Are we still, not going to do that? Well, we're going to be bringing forward the uh, agreement at some point in time to revisit that, but there's no guarantee that the city will, will agree to those costs because the current agreement doesn't make them responsible for that. In fact, it specifically says the fees related to the dam are the responsibility of the district. We need to be being kid earlier. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so the total change is about $41,000. So we can see from the old one, it was 426 to the new operating, it's 472. So <clears throat> it's about the same change. Um, we've had a few, I think that's pretty much all that was done in there. There may have been minor changes in labor, but it's pretty much the same. Um, <clears throat> and then this slide here shows the summary of the operating expenses. And Mike's actually going to walk through some of the water sales and uh, ready to serve charges and water purchases on this slide. So this is something you haven't seen before. We've been talking about all expenses to date. So now we've incorporated some uh, estimates of water purchases and water sales, and that's what Mike will be discussing. What did that change from? Um, um. No, this isn't actually a change. This slide here, I just want to show you. This is the this is page 11 of your budget, I believe. Okay. And the top section where it says operating revenues. Yep. We're going to be talking about those revenues. We haven't presented those before. The only reason I highlighted the operating expenses is I rolled it up there. Just to, that's what we've already talked about. It's been presented twice now. I just kind of summarized that so I can put it in the slide. I okay. And, and talk about the revenues. Thank you. So as Wes said, we we haven't discussed really the revenue portion of it or even the water purchases. We went to a meeting at the Santa Rosa County Water Authority last week, two weeks ago, and they talked about it's still preliminary, but the preliminary um, charges for next year and overall. They're projecting about a 4.3% increase in water that they're going to pass on to the member agencies. Each member agency is a little bit different depending on your mix of water and your fixed charges. Ours was about 4.2%. So our um, rates from the water authority are going to go up about 4.2% for, um, for acre foot of water. So what's changed since last year? Well, one of the issues, as you know, it's been raining a lot. <laughs> So we're not selling as much water. Right. And if, um, if you remember last year, I did a, I had an Excel spreadsheet, which I could bring up if we need to, that showed what the sensitivity analysis. It's one of the first times we really did a sensitivity analysis. If we sold 5% less water, what would that mean? Um, you know, originally, you know, people might think, oh, it's 5% less revenue. Well, it's not, it's, it comes to about 7% less revenue. Right. So keeping that in mind right now, we're probably about 9.7% below, right, 97, 9.7% below what we budgeted for water sales this year. Okay. And it's because of that rain. Okay. So you'll notice that for the budget this year, we had about 31.8% um, budget for fiscal year 18, 19. And we're probably projected to come in at around 29 million. So it's down about to almost $3 million. And the corresponding piece, if you just go, we'll jump down to the purchases real quick. We were purchased, budgeted at 32 and a quarter, and we're gonna come in at about 30.6. So down about 2.6. So we're losing um, three-ish million, 2.9 million in revenue, and saving about 2.6, 2.5 million in expenditures. 1.6. I'm sorry, 1.6, okay. So the net is? About one and a half-ish million dollars. So, and we knew that coming in, and we had a, you know, we kind of had that built in. 
going forward now, you'll notice that the budget for 1920 is the same as the budget for 1819. Wes accused me of just cheating and copying the number over. <laughs> it's not. It's my 250,000 lines of data, as you guys know. And I'm I was like, like that's that. just lazy. I know, it's just lazy. <laughs> uh, and you'll also notice that the water purchases are the same. But believe me, it's, it's through a lot of analysis and, and detailed numbers that come into there. So, and let me get my glasses real quick. So, this current fiscal year, we budgeted to purchase 16,700 acre feet of water. And we're probably going to purchase 15,000. And that's all sources? That's all sources. Desal, OWD, sure. Water Authority. Um, next year, so this year I was saying it was 16.7. Next year we're going to project about 16.1. So we are going to be a little bit less um, just because of the, the, the rain that we're having. And so we're re, kind of reestablishing. I use like a, four, a three to five year rolling average of what our previous has been. And since we've come down a little bit, I feel it's probably prudent to come down a little bit on our projections for next year. This fiscal year actually started really good. Yeah. The rains that we were like five to 10% ahead uh -huh. of, of the budget numbers on the water sales, but it just died in the, in the rain months. Yeah. yeah. So, it's still raining. Yeah. So, and then on sales for this year, we projected 15, originally budgeted 15,650 acre feet. And we're going to come in at about 14.1. So, we're going to be down about 1,500 acre feet in sales. For next year, um, we're projecting about 14.9, 14,900. So, 800 more than we're projecting for this year based on, our, on the rain. Um, part of that will be growth. And part of it will be a little bit rebound from that. So, um, just want to make sure I got my numbers right. So, yeah. So next year we're it's uh, again thirty one million eight hundred thousand in water sales. Our rate of serve is pretty stable. Um, it obviously doesn't depend on the rain anything like that. So it's at about thirteen point eight. And um, so the purchases again we're we're going to be purchasing a little bit less water, but because of the four point three percent increase that's coming up from the water authority it brings it back up to about that 32 and a quarter million. So that's really where we are. And again, these are preliminary numbers as um, Water Authority is going to refine their numbers. I don't expect them to change that much. Um, but as they refine them, I'll update my schedules too. And um, what are we receiving interest for? <clears throat> that is just miscellaneous interest which would probably be from like our bank account earnings <clears throat> and actually it might be up a little bit this year because anthony's done a good job at improving that you want to talk about that the <laughs> <laughs> he said he wanted to throw one of them <coughs> but, we don't, but we don't see it change there we do yeah that, that's, that's my fault i sh actually should have increased that because i just assumed it'd be me doing it and then nothing exciting would happen but then we got anthony and and he actually made some improvements well, well, I, mean, I think us about all the stuff we're losing Anthony, <laughs> we're gaining. We're not showing on this. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the uh, the earnings rate on our and this is sprung on me. So I think the earnings rate <laughs> on our bank account was about 0.01 percent. We negotiated that up to about 0.4 basis points, which still isn't good for, for the market. But on a government checking account, that's a, a little bit more uh, marketable. So I think that equates from about eight dollars in interest per month to about 300. <laughs> So that's a big change. That's yeah. what I thought. That's why I wanted to talk about it. Percentage-wise. I, I, I will. I'll make that change. It kind of pales. It's just preliminary. Yeah. 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 I, I make that change. Shows where Anthony yeah. made money. That's right. Yeah. Anthony made some money. I'll put a little note here, too. <laughs> please have him explain that to the entire board. I'm going to be interested. Were you losing in the rounding area? Because we just rounded in there a thousand. Yeah. Pretty much round. That's why it just gets lost. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, water purchases, water sales. So next we're going to go into the changes in the wastewater budget. So this was the original presentation on March 14th of the operating request for uh, sewer. Uh, you can see here we had a 3.1% increase in the original request. One thing to note is that Encina hadn't submitted their budget yet. We didn't have a draft of their operations yet. We did have capital, but we didn't have the operations. So there's nothing here for Encina. So we just had the same number as last year for the budget. So these are the changes that were made to the sewer. Uh, the Mara Resort dam fee pretty much looks like the same increase, $5,000. We had easement surveys, went from $5,000 up to $10,000. The hillside property, again, the sewer portion is the $9,000 and the rest. This is basically the sewer side of the water of the other changes. It's fifty-one forty-nine. So total changes here, except for that we, were, we looked at the 
collections and conveyance department and decided that some of the other could be trimmed. So we actually took $27,000 from the, the other in the collections and conveyance department to reduce the budget by 27000 there. So the overall change in sewer is about 17000 So now the change is 395 or 3%, so down from the other 405. <clears throat> uh, Good job. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, and you can see the highlighted is where those changes are reflected, and the total is 3% now. Uh, and then moving on, I also wanted to highlight that Encina's still not in this one because I wanted to give apples to apples comparison. Where will Encina's... Uh, it, it'll be in the purse. next slide. Yeah, oh, the purse? No, okay. Yeah, I'll actually show you it to you in the next slide. The next slide, okay. Yep. <clears throat> so, I Encina's not thought. here, but here's the ta-da moment because they have given us their budget now. It has been approved by oh. their board and will be brought to our board probably May so 15th. Now it's going way down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, Encina's change is $738,000. That's the result of the accelerated payments on their PERS. What's on their board? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think Craig is. So, they are going to be paying off their PERS over the next three years, and our portion of that is $789,000. Right. So, our operating budget actually went down due to flows from Encina, but uh, the change is still seven thirty-eight. dollars so really it's a $50,000 increase. <clears throat> uh, so that's overall it's 8.6 percent as a result of the change in Maybe they should have with the 10-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> well they wanted to give it, it was 917,000 originally we got it down to 788. You saved us a lot of money though thank you very much. A lot of money. So this is the summary of the operating the sewer operating and again I just rolled up the total expenses in the highlight item that's what we've talked about to date. So now Mike's going to talk about the revenue side of the, the sewer budget. Yeah, for the sewer, there really isn't much change at all. The rates right now are projected to stay the same. And in actuality, the projected 1819, you'll see that the budgeted 1819, projected 1819, and budget 1920 are all the same. Really, it'll probably go up about fifty to seventy thousand dollars just for about a one percent growth. We didn't put that in there yet. It'll be in there. So it'll it'll, it'll be like eighteen to eighteen point one for budget nineteen twenty. Okay, so not much to talk about from there. So that looks good. What did you guys wait? Yeah, what about expense? So the, the expenses were here. This was the okay. sewer expenses. <clears throat> so that's just those numbers rolled up to the highlighted area there. I always bet. It just blows me away when we go from it. Um, uh, it's actually not that bad. I was looking at 1718. So the next slide. <coughs> The last, I just wanted to bring the salaries and benefits. We talked about these in the last meeting. Uh, and in the last meeting, we presented the change of 484 in the salaries, which is here. Broke that down by position and showed you what was causing that change, and that the total change would be 917000 with uh, labor and benefits. So since then, we've actually reduced the AGM position to four months to kind of, uh, well, let's just say we reversed it to four months. <clears throat> and as a result, this is the new uh, salaries, and this is the sheet that I gave you in case you wanted to have something like compared to it just easier for you to read mm -hmm. but now it'll be 366 with four months or and seven hundred eighty thousand dollars total so it's down from 917 to 780 as a result of that change so if we if we reduce it to zero months how does the we can always add it down the road in a future budget right mm -hmm. it's not permanent right i'm Plus, just thinking and this is one one board member's uh, thoughts as we're going through this I mean, we're seeing these significant increases that we have no control over from the Water Authority and from Encina. Nothing we can do about it. Um, the only thing we can control is what we can make our, our own stuff. So I just think at this point, given those increases, we're not we're not at a point where I I could even think about an AGM right now. Doesn't mean that we won't think one, you know, when we go through this next year. But for right now, I I mean I just take it out. That would save an extra seventy. I think seventy about seventy thousand. But every little penny is going to count as we go through this. Well, whatever savings we can do, we can need to try and do. Even we can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about uh, water authority. Water authority. <coughs> okay. But there were two things. There wasn't just uh, what was the other thing? Well, there's an asset management supervisor position. Oh yeah, that's, that's included, and, and, and it's and still in here. Okay, but I think I, I don't know the full board to make that decision, but I think that. We can contract that out and not, every time you had an employee, I mean, I think, I forget the number you had for the employee, was it 115? 106. 
106, but that was plus, plus. that plus 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 wasn't on there. That's really a two hundred thousand dollar employee. But like one sixty, one sixty, one thirty, one sixty. Uniform and one sixty two. Uniform for this person. Days off, sick days, vacations. There's a lot of money in there, and uh, <coughs> to me, I don't know. I I I know we we have pipes getting older, but it ain't all of them. It's only some. And the potential to bring in a consultant to do that with the incredible staff that we now have that's been doing it, that gives them a little help that they need on the older pipes. And again, I don't believe in the argument, well, we just had two breaks, and uh, doesn't mean if you hire a guy, he's going to find those breaks before they happen. Doesn't mean that at all. I mean, it's possible, but doesn't mean it's going to happen. Who knows? You might look at the wrong pipe, or you might have a newer pipe that explodes. I mean, so. I just don't see it as a necessity. I'd rather see it. I hate adding employees. It's just very expensive for an employee. The one one clarity: uh, consultants are being hired to actually perform the asset management plans. Uh, somebody needs to run the program when it's done because that's an in-house thing. Uh, it ties in. It's not just about broken pipes. It's about looking at our asset replacement schedule. And it, it's uh, you're looking at so it. If you look at it at short range, it, it costs money. If you look at it at a long range, you have seven, you know, 600 million plus assets in the ground, and you could literally extend the life of those assets if they're managed correctly, save assets, replace So Right now, when we hit something, um, Sagewood, before the board, this board took seat, was a perfect example. We had 16, 17 breaks in less than a half mile pipe. Uh, we replaced that whole pipe. We replaced that whole pipe because we had so many breaks. Um, when we replace that whole pipe, 80% of the pipe we replaced, perfect shape. Perfect shape. We had no idea. We had you know, 14, 15, 16 breaks in less than a half mile of pipe in a, in a cul-de-sac. I mean, we were out there several times uh, you know, making those right decisions. So we're looking right now at hundreds of millions of dollars of asset replacement coming up. Um, and if we replace... 10% of the bad stuff instead of replacing the whole thing, you're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars of savings to the repairs. Uh, that program is is going to have to be run by somebody at the end of the day. Consultants are being hired. We're outsourcing everything we can, but at the end of the day, somebody's going to have to run the program for the district in, internally. It, all, it sounds great, but how, I mean, if it, if, it sound, if it sounds both great and obvious, if it, but if it's so obvious, how come we haven't had the position before? Well, because our system is fairly new. Yeah, this is something you get into when you get kind of the middle to older age yeah. of your of your system. Yeah, I mean we're we're young. We're a young district. We uh, we're fairly new. A lot of it was built up during the development booms that we've had. You know, whether it was booms in the eighties, nineties, and booms in the two thousands, obviously. Um, our legacy systems are the older, older, older stuff uh, is made up fairly robust steel. The steel is great. It lasts for long, long time, and then when it breaks, it's pretty bad, but it lasts for a long time. You know, you're talking 50, 60-year-old pipes. And then the sewers, especially the old clays, uh, they have lots of problems, but they usually don't break, is the good news. Uh, but they start crumbling after a while. But they, you know, they can last 70, 80 plus years before they crumble. Well, you know, our sewer systems are lazy stuff that we're looking at, the stuff that we spilled recently. You know, a lot of that stuff is 1980s, 1950s, 1950s. 60s, you know, and, and so on. Now, we're replacing a lot of those systems. It's a position that the board could definitely pass on, and, you know, the internal staff will do what it can, and we will save both, you know, to be just frank, both on the labor and expenses, but you also save on, um, you know, we won't be able to do a lot of those ass assessments. We just don't have the manpower to do it. Because no matter what, it, you know, when we reported this to um, the uh, engineering committee, you know, it takes time to manage a consultant. They don't know our system. They don't, they're, not allowed, they're not allowed to go out there and start digging holes in our pipe. You have operations staff. You have coordination. Uh, somebody has to crunch it there. Somebody has to input it. But the big thing is it, it's, this thing integrates with not only our financial systems, it also integrates with our computer maintenance and management system. Our macro system is a huge, robust IBM-run system, how we operate and compute data. That's how we do basically everything in operations. So we're going to integrate that with this system to now you got basically what maintenance is being on, being done and the asset manager looking at that and saying, oh, this maintenance is becoming too much. 
we need to change the strategy. We can't just go out there and keep on fixing this. There needs to there needs some assessment, it needs to replace so. the, the example you just gave, which one was it? <coughs> give me an example of a pipe that we had 18 different brakes in. Oh, oh safely. Yeah. Okay. And all we had to do was fix where the brakes were. You don't have to fix the part that isn't broken. I get it. Yeah. But you're going to end up changing the entire thing. Was that the duct tail pipe? Yeah. So every time they potholed or every time they stuck something in it, it broke the, it broke the outside seal and water got in and it, it broke. Yep. So you had to replace the whole thing anyhow. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if you, you dig every 10 feet and replace that little piece, but I don't just replace the entire pipe anyhow. So, well, it all depends. If you do or, condition assessment and you run it down that pipe and it'll tell you where all those pinhole leaks are and where you're starting to get that external corrosion, and if it's every 10 feet, and then you may say, let's replace the yep. whole thing. If you find out it's every 150 feet, then you may be making a different decision. So in that that's case, what it was every 10 feet. That's no, no, it was, it was grouped in two groups. Yeah. Yeah. We replaced the whole pipe. So we probably had a quarter mile pipe that we replaced. That, was that pipe was how old? 10 years. So it's not a pipe that you would have put on your to-do list. You would have put the much older pipes on your to-do list. Yeah, well, we're doing a duct iron assessment uh, is one of the proposed jobs to do everything that's based on pressure, age, and history, we're going to start doing. So we're doing pipes that are 10 years old and newer because it's just in an area where there's either been history or it's a high pressure area or what we call transient pressure zones, which means pumps turn on and they see spike pressures. And then when the pumps turn off, they see lower pressures because what happens in pipeline system is it, it's, a, it's a fatigue factor. Mm -hmm. So it's a fatigue factor. Uh, there's different ways we go, and obviously this is uh, something that we've pushed off for since 2012. About, uh, yeah, I think this is the single most important thing the district could get into is more detailed asset management. Yeah. Well, well, let's I thought it was let's, AGM. That's second for four. Uh, let's stick to the plan, and then mm -hmm. uh, see you reduce much, it. Much like the uh, the investment strategy, um, show us the results. Well, you know, you're not going to see results. You can't. Well, well not immediately. You'll, you'll, but, you'll show, you'll show time, little you things, should. but over time, yeah. yeah. It's a long term plan. It's a long term. It's a long game. For sure. Let me just ask another question. Is someone that we now have doing that? Isn't that being done no. internally? No. Not by anybody. We don't, we don't have the system set up for it. So we have the computer maintenance and management systems in Maxwell, which we, uh, we put together uh, basically right around the recession time. And that's being used in operation. That basically details 90% of what ops does in the CMMS system. Uh, we have our financial systems, and those systems don't really integrate. Uh, we have some integration, but they don't really integrate. The other thing that this will uh, spit out is really a financial plan. So, you know, for example, we have reserves, floors, and ceilings. Uh, but you know, are our reserves high? Are they low? Are they artificially high? Are they artificially low? We don't really know. But when you have an asset management plan that lays out what the reserves need to be, then you could really truly see how much you need to collect. And then as we track it along over time, you can see how you're extending asset life. So you could actually calculate the difference. So Water Authority did a great presentation at one of the board meetings that said, you know, based on their asset management system, they've saved $125 million over the last 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or whatever they've been doing. Most of the systems we have now, we're looking backwards. We're tracking the stuff that we already did, either financially or work order-wise. The proper asset management helps you look forward. It helps you predict where you should be doing the work. It helps you either financially or from a oper field operations perspective. Okay. I, I think I gave the uh, analogy, and I, I say this because I still feel burnt by it. <clears throat> My car needed brakes, they told me. So I brought in 5,000 miles after they told me, oh yeah, you still need brakes. <coughs> I asked them for the pads. Um, got them back, two thirds of the pads were gone and 40,000 miles, which means there was a third of a pad left. Well, I could have lasted a little bit longer. I don't know that an asset manager is gonna make any better uh, adjustment uh, for what he, he needs to do. And he's 160,000, not 105,000. We need to show loaded costs, I mean, why? Why are we not showing the loaded costs? It's, they're, they're in there, and they're, they're separated right. between salaries and benefits, but uh, oh, okay. it's, it's um, all in there. Yeah, I, I just, I, I understand the rationale what you're going for. I just don't think we have that so, many older pipes. So the Finance Committee won't make a, a recommendation on that specific position? So come to the board and sell it? Yep. But I do have a hard stop, and these guys are all going to go into <laughs> overtime here in about 30 seconds, so. Okay, let's move it along. Okay.
Take that shot in your shade. You got till 5.30. Okay, so oh, there you go. I don't next item is the, the capital changes. So this is what was presented at the last meeting on the 15th. Um, here you can see the, really what I'm going to just focus on, nothing's really changed except for the future project. So it was 16.1, 61.9 million dollars. We can't talk anymore because I stopped and now I can't start again. Um, <clears throat> So that, those were the future projects. In looking at the future projects, we found that some of those are actually out in fiscal year 41, 42. Our budget document is a 10-year document. It's a one-year budget with a five-year projection and a 10-year long-range forecast. So there's no need to include uh, projects that are in 41, 42. So we actually took seven million out of that. The total was 147 before. So now it's gonna be 54 million and 140. And really that's all, we've, all the changes we made to the capital budget request. But I did wanna show that to the committee. Uh, so moving on, next we took all the capital budget requests and the operations and everything and rolled it into the five-year reserves, the long-range. So like as I mentioned, it's a one-year budget, five-year projection, and a, and a five-year long-range plan on top of that. Those are the last pages of your budget. So if you look on pages 97 through 101, you'll see the five-year reserve projection. That's what this is summarizing. So instead of showing you all five of those pages, I'm just putting it all into one page for you. So you can see in 1920, and what we really need to look at here, and this is where I get kind of excited, because this is, to me, is where we start planning, looking at things like PERS, and whether we need to issue debt, and all of those good, fun things. Um, <clears throat> but you can see in 1920, the major things to note, I think, where you can look at the reserve balances, which are, you know, after operating reserves, going to be at $53.4 million. The ceiling is going to be 89.4, and the floor will be 26.7, so we're somewhere right in the middle there. So not too bad in 1920 and it's pretty much along those lines all the way out through 2324. notice that the title of this slide is uh the reserve projections with no debt so the other thing we need to look at is we got to look at our rating criteria so we have to meet our debt service coverage ratio which per our covenants is 115 percent uh, and in this case we're at 187 down to 153 at the lowest so in all five years we're looking okay from a debt service coverage perspective then we need to look at our days in cash, another thing that, that Fitch is going to look at when they come and give us our ratings. So in 2019-20, and I think I mentioned last year, the, the median for a AA plus is like 497 or something like that. We were well below that in previous years. And this budget so far, and this preliminary, it will change, but we're looking at about 411 days in cash for 1920, and it goes down to 250 when you get in the outer years in 23-24. That's mainly as a result of $17 million in capacity projects that we have in 23-24. We have about six to eight million the year before that in 22-23, so it does drop off from, from 353 to 333. And looking at those outer years and their outer years. So keep in mind when I'm talking about all this stuff, this is planning, it's a one year budget. The only thing that the board is approving on June 5th right. is the one year, so 1920. Mm -hmm. So no matter what we decide, how we move stuff around here and do the planning, mm -hmm. Whether we decide to pay PERS, do that stuff, the only thing that will be approved at the meeting will be 1920. What was our days in cash last year? Um, actually, I have it right here for you. It's on page like 101 or something like that. So, in night, well, that's get service. So, last year in 19, looks like we had 410, so we we're about the same in the first year of the budget. And then we went to 323, 319, 321, and 279. So pretty much staying the same with this. But that was also with that assumed, and I think it was. Well, my question was the County of San Diego, uh, last time they came out, that they had 43 days in cash. Hmm. So that, what are they reading? Really? That can't be possible. It is. It's about 43 days of cash. Yeah, that, that was it's all they had. So they're, they're combining. The whole county? Yeah, that, that's Jim Desmond's number. I think you were at that. Are they making their investments non liquid? I don't like Because our reserve balance includes. Well, it costs them a lot to run the county. Right? But that's what they were saying. Yeah. Well, the maybe. burn rate is very high. And that's a very unstable county. What's their credit rating? Yes. Don't <laughs> that. that's, that's what I want to know because yeah. I keep hearing this days of cash, but. Their credit rating really can't be that bad, but yet that's... Well, what, I would think one of those two things is, is off. Like yeah, is I, I don't remember. I remember Jim talking about that, but I don't remember it being... My my understanding is the county has always had strong, or at least in recent, strong credit uh, years, oh. strong credit and also strong reserves. Yeah. Well, so I could, it because people have been so strong that people have been trying to go in and get it. Yeah. 
They so, say they have strong reserves, but the people trying to go to get it, that's what Jim came out and said. Hey, we don't have that many days in cash. We're not that strong. Maybe he's making up a calculation. I'll find out. I'll find out. But we could actually. I'll find out and bring it up to me. Yes. <laughs> um, but we can probably we can get their surveillance, I'm sure, and see what the like Fitch rated them and, and what they said, because one of the components of that would be the days in cash. If you could do that, I'd appreciate it. I'll see I can ask Jim, but he's a politician, so he might be telling the truth, although he always does. I'll see if I can find the publications. That's the you want to see San Diego County. Next lobby. San Diego County. Yes. San Diego County. How many days in cash are they, and what's their rating? I'll try to find that for you. I'll do my best. Do the man. <clears throat> okay, so. This is projections with no debt. So one of the things I have to do here is I'm going to, even though it, it's not being approved by the board, I still do the five-year lookout. So I'm going to plug in debt where necessary. And actually, since we have the ability and we actually have the capacity fee model, the cap fee model says that we should be issuing debt for cap fee projects, right? So in 22, 23, well, first, I just went through all these without showing you my circles. So I'll go through the circles. So here's the projections with debt. <clears throat> so you can see here, I've got $6 million. We have $6 million in projects in 22-23. I'm assuming $6 million in debt. Realistically, you'd probably issue, because I'm showing $20 million here, you'd probably mm -hmm. issue $26 million in 22-23 to cover both of those years. But here we're plugging in the year that it's actually being expended. And it turns out that we're going to be at 367 and 390 if we fund capacity projects with debt in those the corresponding years. If we do $26 in debt. $26, $26 million. million, correct. So, that being said, one of the things that we can do from here, and if you look at your reserve pages, I made a, I didn't highlight it, but I did leave a row for funding per UAL. So working forward from here, we're going to start looking at our capacity to pay down the PERS. Using this, to possibly plug it in. I, I'm in discussions on saying, okay, if we set the days in cash at 300, we maintain our debt service coverage ratio, all of our other rating criteria. And if we plug in a, a payment to PERS, how much can we pay without going below those criteria? Um, doing some scenarios like that, and we'd like to get feedback from the committee. What are some of the ideas you'd like us to, to test out to bring back to you and show you? And, and I'm actually working on getting a model so we can kind of plug in numbers and see what the results would be. That's where we're going to work forward from here and, and have some fun with doing that. that that's a great idea. So, and Mike will have 500,000 different ways to do it, right? <laughs> I will show you plugging it in, how it affects the reserves, the interest savings, so on and so forth. So, that. Yeah. so that's what we have for the budget. Uh, now we're going to go into the cost of service study timeline, um, unless you have any questions on what, this. What's, uh, what, what is your estimated time it's going to take for the rest of the presentation? Um, this is the last slide. Yeah, after this, it's just the calendar. Okay. So we have the timeline, calendar, and then we're done. Okay. So all we're doing here is we're actually, we've got the RFP, kind of we're working on that, getting it wrapped up. We're doing the timeline to bring to the board. Uh, so we're actually working on issuing the RFP, hopefully in the next couple weeks. Uh, we're hoping they'll have their results back to us in July. Uh, then we're gonna bring the preliminary results to the board committee, which will be the finance committee in August. We will do the final analysis implementation, develop the plan and bring that to the committee to share what our plan is for implementation. Um, <coughs> we actually, it didn't make it to the slide for some reason, but we did stick in one more deliverable, and that's final analysis and implementation plan to the full board, and that would be in September 2019. We went in September? Yeah, later in the month, right. the same month that we take it to the board okay. committee, then we'll take it to the full board. Okay. So then we're going to have to bring the Prop 218 notice to the board for approval in October. Uh, we will have the hearing in December for and plan on having the rates implemented in January of 2020. So that's the plan for the cost of service study as it stands now. It's just we're starting that. We just wanted to run the kind of timeline by the committee. Um, and that's pretty much it for that. I thought you had numbers for the cost of study we already done. No, we're putting money into the budget to pay for the to cost pay of service. Oh, yeah, 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 it's a $45,000 estimate right now. And we're doing a full cost of service study in that $45,000. Yeah, for water and wastewater. So that's that. Other than that, we're going to go on to the next meeting is May 13th. In that meeting, we will come forward with some scenarios, uh, start looking at the PERS, and review the draft proposed budget before that. We're hoping to have the board workshop on May 29th, unless we can actually maybe do one earlier so that we can look at the PERS scenarios and give the full board more options as far as what they'd like to see and show them how they'll, they'll work out in the budget. Uh, I-13, that's not the... Uh, Aqua thing in Monterey. That's next week. 
it's five, five six. May, yeah. yeah. Five six, yeah. 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 I think I'm good on my May thirteenth. Okay. So, so May thirteenth is the tentative date. If you're good with that, that'll be our next meeting and we can kinda of move forward from there. Yeah. So that's it. Um, really the board hopefully we're approving the budget in June on June fifth at that meeting. And that's the presentation for today. I'll see you on May thirteenth. Any other questions, comments? I went a little fast there towards the end, but I don't no, know. No, that was good. I'm sorry. Kind of commitment. Yep. So. Right. Okay. Uh, move to adjourn. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, guys.